Welcome to the Learning with Lowell podcast. I am Lowell Thompson, and my lifelong love of learning saved my life. A few years ago, I was in and out of the ER and ICU with no end in sight due to, at the time, a mysterious illness. I read medical journals, talked to scientists and researchers, and learned how to develop a good treatment plan, all of which put me on the path to becoming healthy, which I am now. I have met the team responsible for creating the drug that saved my life, and now I am taking my experiences and love of learning and translating them into interviews with experts, CEOs, and scientists in order to achieve three goals in hopefully every episode. To have fun and interesting conversations that are enjoyable to listen to, to learn what these people are developing and creating, to hear what their tactics, strategies, tools, books, and resources they use to accomplish what they were doing so that you can help navigate your career to help build the startup that you want to build. The best way to help out is to subscribe. Check out the learnwithlowell.com website where you'll have show notes, hyperlinked notes so you can click around in the audio. Every term that we talk about in the episodes go into those notes and they're clickable. There'll be links to everything in the show notes at learnwithlowell.com. The best thing you can do is to sign up to the weekly content letter that I put out. It comes out every week. It is fantastic. It comes from the interviews with guests. It comes from me just reading a lot on the on the internet. You'll have book recommendations, video, articles, things to help you progress in your careers, things to help you develop your startup, things to, that are just fun and entertaining to listen and watch. You'll have all that every week. So definitely sign that up, check it out, and tell all your friends about it. That's the best thing you can do to help. Today is a recording of the first live stream we ever did. It was this past Friday. And if you want to join along and be a part of live streams, pay attention to the YouTube page and the newsletter and all those types of things as, as well, because I'll be updating. We'll probably be doing one a week. But today we are joined with Daniel Faber. This is a live stream. People were able to ask questions. People were able to engage. And, and it really, it was a lot of fun. But Daniel is the CEO of OrbitFab, which is building a gas station in space. We learn about his origin, how he get into space, how he's built himself up. He is a CEO of Space Arena. He is the board of director of National Space Society. He's the president and CTO of Helicentric Technologies. He was a former CEO of Deep Space Industries, like on and on and on and on. This guy is fantastic. We're going to learn a lot about him. He's going to answer questions about what he's building now, how he's building it in space, etc., etc. the amazing stuff that's going on. This is an episode for people who are excited about space. This is an episode for people who want to get a sense of the man behind the CEO, the passion behind the person. And so without further ado, we're going to get into this. This is the entire live stream people will ask questions it is a lot of fun and honestly i think this is something we're going to keep doing from here on out because it was a lot more fun like I, I you all have questions that you send me emails to and i love hearing them i love reading them but you know like you can actually engage while something's going on and ask a question which i think is fantastic so let's get into this cue this up all right hangout is now live all right that means we're on there we're we're, we're now on there and i will try and type something All right, sweet. Yeah, that. yeah, we're doing it. We this. Is... Oh, I can hear myself. Why can I hear myself? Oh, yeah, I know why. I'm sorry. One second. I have the live stream up in another tab. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why can I hear myself? Oh, oh God, I hope I can fix this. All right, so um, today we're we're joined with Daniel Faber. He is the CEO of of uh, Orbit Fab. Hopefully, I'm just pronouncing that right. And um, basically, the concept is putting a gas station in space, um, or at least that's how I describe it. Is, is that a, is there a better way or a colloquial way that you like to describe what you're building? That, that's exactly how I put it. We're building gas stations in space. Is that a picture of it in the in your background on your screensaver? Oh, the, uh, the the picture back there. Yeah, that's that's one of the the honest interpretations of of where we might get to. Mm -hmm. it, it looks good. So the. As I said in the preamble, and for people listening in, this is uh, this is a uh, one of the first. This is the first live stream we've ever done, so there's probably gonna be some hiccups and stuff, but we're gonna figure it out. And uh, but before that, I I kind of pinged a bunch of people and asked for any questions they want to ask Daniel, and then I have my own stuff I want to ask. And uh, but this one person in particular, I thought of a I don't know, it was kind of funny. They didn't think I was gonna ask it, but uh, I thought it it'd be a, a fun like way to get started. But the the question. It starts like his first one's kind of silly, and then he'll ask a, a, a serious one. But um, if they put a Sunico on the moon, would it be called Moonico? Like, um, and that was from <laughs> uh, from our space on, on uh, Reddit. Um, that that. Uh, but they 
They said they were curious if there were plants to somehow farm renewables from other planets, moons that can be used as full. And if so, how long would it take to bring that to fruition as their actual serious question and not the Munica one? So <laughs> I, I love the question. Um, somebody should start Munica. I think that's great. Uh, <laughs> the, the second question, um, I mean, my, my background, I got into this because, um, well, 20 years ago, I decided it would be a fun career trying to get people off Earth. Um, and also, you know, pretty important for humanity. But I was trying to figure out how to play, how to pay for it. And uh, there are only two ways that I could think of paying for it, either tourism or mining. Uh, and I couldn't see myself as a tour operator. So I basically spent 20 years trying to figure out asteroid mining. Um, and so, yeah, when you say, will we eventually get uh, propellant from asteroids in the moon? I, I hope so. Definitely hope so. That's, uh, that's where it's headed. In fact, you, you mentioned the artwork behind me. I'll, I'll show you another piece. These are from Brian Bastig. And uh, I'm not sure if you can make that out, but uh, this is this is one of the pieces on our wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's our inspirational art that's around the place. Absolutely oh, love the uh, I know, I know. Just I think like a week or two ago, you guys were on the ISS, and you, I believe, you demonstrated the the new fuel clamp. I, I don't want to like describe it in a proper way, but that's like one of the first steps to having an actual gas station in space where people can kind of like lock in. And transfer fuel around um but going from i think that event to actually having something in space are like are we talking like like years or like how far do you think you'd have it it'd take to get to that point yeah so the, the things we have on the international space station are, are two tanker test beds mm -hmm. so one is a, a little rigid tanker that went up full of water and the other one's actually an inflatable tanker that, that launched stowed and then inflated so we tested all the pumps the valves the plumbing the two different types of tanks um, and, uh, and yeah, some of the technology for, for how we connect all that together. Um, and then we pump water into the space station and, and sort of supplied the space station with water that was all done inside the space station. But that, that little rigid tank is actually exactly what we plan to fly as our first, uh, sort of minimum viable product tanker. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it needs some solar panels and it needs like radios and, and avionics because there's no astronauts floating around all the time to press the buttons. But, uh, but apart from that, it's, it's ready to go. So, uh, we expect that we'll have our first tiny little operational tanker up as a demonstration as early as next year. Oh, wow. That's really fast. Uh, oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good time for this. And this, this kind of leads into a, another question that uh, a, a person asked or they put, let's see if I can find it. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. So the, per, the person asked their kid like this, like they, they told them what you were working on and like, what questions would you have for the, for them? And the question was, would they have uh, roller taquitos and cold drinks? And um, I love it. Yeah. So, other than having an automated one, are there future plans to have a, having people on it, or is it just the most viable options who always have an automated gas station that people can kind of go and get what they need with their satellites and then move on? Well, even even your gas stations getting automated these days. So, <laughs> um, we we've talked with a few companies that want to build private space stations and things, and they're going to need air and water and. Uh, they might be building satellites that, that they want to put fuel into. So there's a whole bunch of things that, that could be done with people. Uh, in terms of the, the refueling, it's probably going to be robotic. Uh, but we'll see when when we have bigger stations and more complex and maybe we're doing sort of fuel processing and mixing, that kind of thing. Um, when it gets complex enough, definitely having a human there really makes a difference. And like I said, my goal in all of this is I want to create some permanent jobs in space. Mm -hmm. So I really hope that we find a, a good excuse to put humans up there. Sounds good. Uh, I hope, hope that answered uh, the person. Um, the I, and then the, this follow-up question is similar. Like, how long do you think it would take us to go from uh, mining uh, terrestrial fuel to going more off-world with our fuel sources? Um, I don't know if there if you have like an ambitious timeline in mind before you're mining like the moon for H three or anything like that. Um, well, yeah, I. I at the moment, we're starting with launching everything on rockets. Right? That's we've got to build the market on the back of that. Um, but the last company that I ran, Deep Space Industries, we we put it out there that we wanted to mine asteroids, and uh, and we started making progress on all the technologies and the mine plans and various things to doing that. Um, a small scale sort of sample return, um, if you want to call that mining, a trial mining campaign, um, that could be done you know, within sort of two or three years if somebody dropped the money on it to do it but more reasonable because you want to test all the technologies and de-risk it. More reasonable is to, to build that out with a sequence of missions and technologies. So depending on the funding, that could happen in as, as short as five years or as many as, uh, as 20 years. 
Mm-hmm. And I, I was reading recently that 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 um I basically were there the the periods between recessions had like this the right now that we have had a period where the um, where we have had not had a recession. I don't know why I'm jumping on this, but basically since our last recession, there a number of years have gone by that in the last like 50 years really hasn't happened where there's just been, you know, overall just like economic growth. Like even if it's small economic growth, it's been growth. And so this year and next year, it seems that people are really primed to invest and be open to these really innovative challenges. And so I'm curious if you're seeing any evidence of that on your end with people's willingness to try new things, to fund new things and to really push the envelope. And if so, if there's any examples you would mind sharing. Yeah, I think this is this is why um, business cycles are actually good for the economy, because you get investments in in more interesting speculative things um, at the top of the cycle. And while a lot of those won't go anywhere, it doesn't take many of them to, to completely sort of come up with new ways of looking at the world. And, uh, and so you get some things that have really big long term benefits that can only get funded when capital is cheap. Uh, but then you also need the other side of the business cycle, which is to, to winnow that down and figure out what things are actually working and uh, and move people off the things that aren't so that they're ready for the new things that come along, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's that's just part of the business cycles. So we've been on the on the end of a long uh, a long bull run at the moment, and uh, you know that hasn't stopped yet. So there's there's a lot of people looking for things to invest in, um, you know, and what might be the next big thing uh, in the space industry. Um, really, VC started to get into this game. Um, sort of 10 years ago, more like five years ago. So the last few years have seen a lot more uh, venture capital coming in, um, some private equity and those types of things. So those uh, investors that got in early, they're waiting to see the returns. They want to see the IPOs and uh, and acquisitions. Um, so some of those are sitting sitting on the sidelines now. But at the same time, while there's more money fl- uh, flowing into venture capital, there's more venture capitalists that are that are interested in having some kind of play in uh, in the space industry. So we're not we're not over this wave if uh, if you consider it as a business cycle. Um, but uh, you know we keep an eye on that in case there's a downturn. If there are some big exits, then it could result in, in a, a real uptick. So there could be a, a flood of money in. So it's dependent on not just the sort of macroeconomic cycles, but also whether there are good exits and uh, and whether the VCs think this is sort of the next big play that they can make their money on. I know the, and in addition, you have like SpaceX kind of helping show how valuable the market can be. I think they just did a, a stock raise or something like that of like 300 million. Um, so it kind of, it kind of like sets the bar like, hey, these are what, what it can be valued at, even if there are not um, exits going on. Cause I think exits or IPOs in the space industry is kind of rare if uh, memory serves. Then again, we have had only a couple of providers over. A couple of decades so like we're seeing a lot of growth in terms of even um the micro satellites for instance like there's a, i think there's like dozens and dozens at this point that are trying to field that like uh someone who was on the podcast is uh um jim Contrell, who's building in um vector launch and he's doing that and he, he came from spacex so but at the same time i think um but you have ipos you have exits um and then you have like people like elon musk and spacex that when they do their race they kind of help show what the potential could be which helps kind of for people who are getting into it, make it, make it easier on them. But so, uh, so, uh, and pot, one of the, one of the people listening in, uh, Tito from impossible labs, I was telling you about, he has, he has two questions and we'll start with the easier of the two. Cause I, I think that, uh, it'll probably, be, uh, quicker, but then we'll go to the other one, which is he, uh, he liked the pictures or the artist rendering. And if he, he's wondering if he could get like a quick office tour, if that's possible. <laughs> yeah, sure. So this artwork come from Brian Vestig, um, and a plug for him. He's brilliant. Um, I'd, uh, I'd suggest that you check out uh, Space Habs, which mm-hmm. is his work. So um, spacehabs.com. Um, and, and so he shipped us a whole bunch of these. He was involved with the last companies that I've been in as well. He's uh, really good. But um, yeah, give you a tour. <laughs> what Jeez. have we got? Um, there's the uh, blackberry mining. Um, over here, we've got our, uh, constru- how to construct a, uh, a big rotating space station. Um, Everyone's favorite successful mega rocket, Apollo. Uh, r- more rotating space stations from Brian. Uh, whiteboards and things. And then uh, this one I like. This is the inside of a, uh, of a toroidal space station. There's another one mm. from, uh, from Brian. Is that, is that an O'Neill ring? So, uh, 
and and the oh. ULA teddy bear <laughs> with a with a rocket equation on the front. That's awesome. The, <laughs> is is that the the inside of an O'Neill ring? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah that's right. So the horizon okay. goes upwards. Yeah, Brian's done a lot of those. They're mm. they're, they're really the, good. Um, I think a popular one that would, that was depicted in uh, space, other than I think 2001: A Space Odyssey, would be Elysium. But hopefully, we don't go that route. We <laughs> we, we go the positive version. But with all the sticky notes, do you do Scrum Agile technology to keep track of everything, or or like what, how do you organize that? Yeah, we we started organizing the whole company on the walls here. Every single wall was completely plastered with sticky notes. Uh, we're now using Trello and Slack and a whole bunch of things, and we've migrated a lot of that online. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's basically how we approach it. Like you've got to get the ideas out there and share them and they're all cross pollinating. And especially at the start, you're trying to figure out exactly where to go and what to spend your efforts on. So uh, yeah, this, the walls were our, were our, uh, our ideation, if you like. Well, it seems like it's trending in the, in the right direction because that wall has a little bit on it, but then that wall has a lot. Um, <laughs> and for people listening in, like there's just a, a, one wall with like maybe a dozen sticky notes. And then another wall with, uh, sorry guys, I have an AC that's loud as heck. Um, another wall with like maybe like four dozen. But so Tito had another question, which is what part of your business would Elon Musk, since we referenced him a number of times, love? And what part do you think he wouldn't wouldn't like or shoot down? Oh, Elon usually likes the business bits of a business that he can take and make his own. Uh, <laughs> so uh he also likes customers, I'm sure. So we'd love us uh, paying him to to launch things into orbit for him, um, and uh, and of course, yeah, we want to launch a lot of propellant. Mm -hmm. Well, I think with his, um, it used to be big, you know, BFG, which I, I'm more partial to than Starship or what it is now, just because the <laughs> the alliterative nature of it. But um, when they're up in space, I think there's. Uh, where they like they they load up with propellant, so like having something like you guys in space already would probably be easier to fuel them up. So that's like he'd probably like that, so he doesn't have to like send up another ship just to fill up like ship one. I think like there was a an interview who gave where it was it would take like three ships to fill up one ship, and then that ship goes to Mars or something like that. So instead, it could just have like a repository like your guys are developing. Yeah, he was well. talking about needing fifteen hundred tons of of hydrogen and methane. Uh, hmm. to send one of his ships to Mars. So that's that's quite a lot of propellant. So, yeah, we're keeping our eye on that. Blue Origin also looking at oxygen, methane. Um, yeah, there's there's some big big ships out there with big plans. Fingers crossed that they find a market for those and they happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Uh, it, it, it's about time. I, I mean, we went from, like, Kitty Hawk to walking on the moon in the course of, like, 40 years. And in the last 40 years, we went from the moon <laughs> to to uh, low Earth orbit. On the moon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a step backwards, but um, I don't know. It, hopefully, we can yeah, step the, it up. The, the Apollo program was was kind of interesting. I've heard it described as a decade of the twenty first century plucked out and put in the twentieth century, and uh, and maybe that's right. Um, now, sort of the rest of the economy and the industry and the technology is all caught up with that. Um, you know, we go back to the moon again. Much better odds that we stay that we set something permanent. So I'm pretty optimistic about that. Oh yeah, uh, the the technology is entirely different. The and like I know people get, you know, a, a little bit out of shape in the idea that I think um, NASA's budget is like half a penny or like four percent of a penny in compared to like the overall budget. But in the in the '60s, it was like sixteen percent. So like we were just really pushing the lever in terms of like what they were getting. But even now, with like less than that, we can get a lot of stuff. Like they just announced, they're sending a like basically a, a like a little mini helicopter to Titan, which I've been excited about, and I've wanted to, like them to send more stuff to Titan. Titan's like my favorite moon. Um, I don't know if you can have a fav favorite moon, but I, I have one, and it's Titan. Do you have a favorite asteroid body in the solar system or uh, or in the universe? Oh, I uh, I like asteroid Bennu. That's uh, that's high on my list. Is it the one that looks like a peanut? That's the one that um, that Osiris Rex is currently at that NASA's visiting. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, they all look like potatoes. It depends if you <laughs> find enough potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So um, one other, I have like a bunch of people that have asked questions, and uh, some of them are, are really good. So um, one question. Uh, we kind of talked about this a little bit, and I'll like I'll, I'll repeat it, and then you can kind of pick the part that's new. But what are some of the projects that are underway? What are the challenges that you're facing right now? And what kind of people are you looking to hire? And then the next part of that is, what are the rules for claiming asteroids for mining? 
which that, that that's brought up a lot. So. <laughs> All right, well, we're, we're not asteroid mining yet, so we'll answer yeah. the first questions first. Um, yeah, so we're getting ready for our operational tanker. That uh, We want to put that up next year. That's that's the big thing. Um, we're also selling fueling ports. That's sort of the, the commercial, little commercial product that we have is uh, a valve for satellites. So you can fill up the tank and then have the option on orbit of, of refilling the tank. So, uh, so those are our, our big things that we're working on. Um, second part of the question, uh, asteroid mining. So the US and Luxembourg passed laws that said that if you extract something, you can own it. If you're a, a US or Luxembourg entity, um, you can own it under the national law, which sort of reports up to the Outer Space Treaty. Um, at the moment, you can't get mineral rights. So you can't get secure tenure over the minerals in the ground. And if you want to raise um, mining finance, you really need that secure tenure. So yeah. that's that's sort of tricky. Um, but we're finding out more about the geology with you know, the Japanese and the uh, the US missions, and there's now uh, European missions planned. So we're learning more about the geology of the asteroids. We'll learn more about the moon as well. Uh, that'll help us then figure out the technology. Um, you know, what OrbitFab is doing is creating a market for the propellant we might get out of asteroids. And, uh, and the moon. So the only two things after that are the uh, are the financing and the regulations. So we're chipping away from pretty much every direction. Yeah, yeah. sounds good. Uh, the only other part is if you are hiring people, who are you looking oh. for? Yeah. Yeah, um, engineers, business development people. Um, those are those are our two big needs. So in the next six months, we expect to to hire, you know, another half a dozen, maybe a dozen, maybe more engineers to to build out that side of the team. Um, but, uh, yeah, keep, keep watching our website and, uh, we'll, we'll be posting up sort of job openings and we're collecting CVs all the time, keeping, keeping track of the best people. Well, excellent. And, um, and just, I know we've been, uh, focusing on OrbitFab, but you have, I think it was like 15 plus years in space for people just like to appreciate how awesome Daniel is, uh, 15 <laughs> years in space, the, you I think you're CEO of a couple other places as well. You're advisor of a number of space startups. So like, you're very much like this is your thing. And so if anyone wants to, even if you're not looking to apply, I think this like Daniel and what he's working on is a great place to see a lens of what's going on in space because we're going to need fuel. You're right. Like even if you were going to go somewhere like fuel and food, like just watch those things. Cause like they'll kind of predict what everyone else is doing. Cause we need to fuel where we're going and we need to eat if we're going to go there. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of where things are going, but definitely check out his website and his stuff. But so, um, Oh, and, uh, and uh, Tito, he yeah. posted a link to the asteroid you mentioned. So it's on Wikipedia. Oh, cool. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and uh, yeah, if people want to want to find me and connect with me, uh, LinkedIn is usually the best place. So uh, look me up on LinkedIn. I don't know if you've uh, got the address you can post there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's uh, it's, it's uh, for people in the live stream, it's in the show notes. But for people in the when it goes up on the podcast, it'll be in the show notes as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cool. So many different screens open right now. The um, so the next question someone wanted to ask is okay. Um, the question is, and this was from I have no idea. It's a long stream of digits. People should have real names instead of uh, digits. But how, <laughs> how will uh, how will they handle? There is no LEO. There is an infinite of LEOs even at any given inclination. Do you have plans for a few depots at different inclinations and then constrain the customers for those launch windows, or is it like? The predominant one is at one LEO station, and that uh, the other ones are just not really in use. That's the question. Yeah, good, good questions. Pretty insightful. So there are sort of a lot of orbits in low Earth orbit that are used in in geostationary orbit. There's pretty much one. That's the equatorial orbit. So that's easy for easier for us to serve there. We'll we'll have uh, a tanker in the, in geostationary orbit or just above it. Uh, in low Earth orbit, there's some favorite orbits. So 98 degrees is a, a favorite orbit for Earth observation satellites because it's the sun synchronous orbit. And so we'll put a tanker in uh, in that orbit. Um, also, a 90 degrees and 70 degrees are popular orbits for telecommunications constellations. So we're likely to put tankers in those inclinations. And then the other one is uh, the International Space Station orbit, just because uh, a lot of things are happening there and satellites are deploying there. Um, and, and of course, the ISS is there. So we're likely to do a, a 56.1 degree uh, ISS inclined uh, tanker as well. So that's, that's the the four that we're really looking at. Um, but then we keep keep tracking, you know, who is launching to where and what the demand is likely to be, and uh, you know, we'll we'll change those plans over time. Excellent. That's 
I know we have the the new from the the new like moon gateway stuff going on. So if that if that works out and we get a moon colony going on, do you do you have plans for one orbiting the moon or on the like a base on the moon? Yeah, you got it. So that's one of the ones that we're tracking fairly closely there and uh, sort of watching what NASA's doing. I think the uh, Wilbur Ross from Commerce Department has said we need a gas station on the moon as well. So mm -hmm. we're also keeping an eye on that. Oh, but uh, so those architectures sort of have to converge first and, and people have got to figure out what they actually want to do. And then we'll get into the technical solutions and how to deliver it. Do you think that we're going to hit that? Like, do you think we could do that? And I think the, the goal is like five years. Do you think like I mean, yeah, the goal was to do it by by the end of, of Trump's second term, assuming he gets one. And mm -hmm. so um, if that's, uh, you know, the pressure is on. Um, yeah. There's nothing that, that technically says we can't. It's a matter of, of political will. And you look at the first Apollo program, America didn't have the rocket technology or any of the technology and had to put everything together. Now we've got most of their technology. So it's just a, a matter of deciding that, yeah, we're going to do it putting enough people on it and getting out of the way. And that's that's what the question comes down to. And then we have uh, reusable rockets now, which um, I think at one point no one thought that was, like I think a lot of people didn't think that you could do that. Um, I didn't have an opinion because I wasn't a rocket scientist. So I was just like, oh, sounds fun. <laughs> I'll just watch. Um, but uh, another another uh, another question, there's uh, only a couple more from that people asked that I, I curated through. There's a couple crazy ones, but um, which is a, a compliment I feel. Uh, to what you're doing but the, so the person says uh damn this is ballsy the though i assume this would be fully automated repairs on site and that type of thing uh what he what the person is asking is if there's a gas station in space will there be a gas station attendant uh it would be hell of a gig we already an, 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 <laughs> asked answer that that that's uh that'd be you know you want to create uh future space jobs so that would be uh in the future um the cars have so another question someone has is orbital propellant depots, gas, gas stations, startups all have the same problem, the chicken and the egg. How are you going to build a propellant depot when current satellites don't have refueling repropellant uh, capabilities? Yeah, okay. really, really good question. That that person clearly knows what they're on about. The um, There are two ways that, that, we, that we're sort of handling that. <clears throat> so we're putting up these gas stations. They're not designed to go out and service the... The, these vehicles. You can, you can imagine all these satellites are like Ferraris. They're hand-built, they cost a lot, but they've got one tank of gas, right? So you, you drive them around the race course a few times, that's great, and then you ditch them and you have to buy a new Ferrari. It's kind of ridiculous. And if you've got any issues with it, like if it breaks down, even if it's still got a full tank of gas, there's no way to go fix it. So there's now companies that are working on building tow trucks. And these tow trucks are you know, satellite servicing vehicles they they also only have one tank of gas, but at least you can go and fix the broken Ferraris and get them back on the track. And uh, and you might take a a big tank in the tow truck, so you give them a little bit of fuel, and you, you tow to the top of the hill and save their fuel and that kind of thing. And a tow truck is is supposed to be cheaper than a Ferrari, right? So these tow trucks, these servicing vehicles, are this intermediate step, and they've got all the equipment to work with satellites that weren't designed to be refueled, or maybe ones that have died and are now in the way, and you want to tow them out of the way, that kind of thing. We work initially with the tow trucks. So they're already equipped to, to handle all these satellites, that, that these um, legacy satellites. But they're in the mindset already of doing dockings and, and thinking about refueling. So we work with them. There's 25 companies that, uh, that we're talking to that are building these tow trucks in space. And, uh, and so that's our, our first line. The second is just working on these fueling ports and, and trying to create something that can be useful across the industry to sort of define the interface it's like building a gas cap for, for all the Ferraris and all the tow trucks. So as that gets adopted, then that will change the industry. So that's making our systems future compatible and helping everybody else be future compatible. So those are sort of the two angles that we take. That makes sense. I know that I know that the for a while that the Russians had just for in terms of like the the docking ports for people to go from point it, like from a like a module, not a module, like one of the little what are they called like the humans get in them and they get shot up into space capsules? and then they capsules thank you <laughs> i always forget like this dude the silliest things so they go from those to um like uh skylab or whatever and they had like a bunch of different ports but now we're trying to standardize that or at least have like docking procedures or uh, adapters so that you can um like go up or down but like i know that 
or at least I think that I was reading that the, the Chinese have the, a, a, a different one as well. Like even just in like going from a capsule to the ISS, like the modules in the, in the United States at least are pretty uniform, but like everyone else is trying to um, slightly do it their own way where like having a uniform or even having like um, maybe potential to have a mechanism to like adapt onto different um, modules is really good. Are, other than just having a uniformity, do you have any plans to develop something that can adapt onto different, uh, for lack of a better term, like uh, uh, fuel hole, holes? <laughs> I don't know what they're called. Yeah. So, so the International Space Station has this uh, international docking adapter, which is designed for you know the pressurized volumes, and so that people can go through it and that kind of thing. It's you know, got to be big enough for people, and uh, and you know it, it needs bigger spacecraft. Um, that's overkill for just transferring propellant. So we've we've designed something that that is like literally that big. You can you can easily hold in your hand sort of both sides of this uh, of this coupling, uh, this fueling port. So at the moment, you know, there's there wasn't anything that uh, that we saw that could do a good job at that, which is why we we worked with about twenty companies put together like solid requirements of what what they needed to do, and uh, and now we've got customers that have started buying these fueling ports. So that's that's the the next step. Um, will we end up with a few standards? Mm, quite possibly, um, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's it's just a matter of getting something that's useful and can do the job. That's where it's got to start. Mm -hmm. In terms of those partnerships, is it a lot of you aggregating what their needs are and then finding a uniform, like kind of like Venn diagram, like what their needs are and then finding like that part, that part in the middle that like meets all the needs? Like how does like that, like 20 companies coming together to make one thing look like? Yeah, yeah and it's it's typical product design, right? You go out and talk to as many customers as you can and they come back and tell you things. Um, but you've got to be skeptical about what they tell you because people won't always tell you what they want. Often people don't know what they want, right? Um, so you've got to then try and read the tea leaves, <laughs> if you like, and, and decide which features you're going to include and which ones you're not, uh, and try and map that out. You call it Venn diagrams. Like how much of, of the utility do you provide without getting too expensive mm -hmm. and limit those features? And then build it, try it, give it to customers, get feedback, break it, and, uh, and fix it, come up with, with a new version. We figure it's going to take us about three iterations, and we're on iteration one. So, uh, so ask me again in six months' time. We should be uh, on at least iteration two, possibly iteration three, um, which will which will be getting pretty close to final. Uh, and then we'll know better as well how many people like what we've got and how much of the market it actually serves. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, it's not supposed to be a human you know, led humans through the through this port. It's not supposed to be cryogenics either. It's yeah. intended for durable propellants. Like it's it's a subset of of what's needed. Mm -hmm. The so Tito, um, who's been uh, in the chat so far, uh, he he really loved the the analogy of t uh, Ferraris and tow trucks. Just I wanted to pay a, a pass along <laughs> a compliment. Great. Thanks, Tito. But um, I thought of two quotes in addition to what you're saying about the idea of like listening to customers, but at the same time, like with a grain of salt. There's a uh, there's Henry Ford who said like you can have it in any color as long as it's black. <laughs> and <laughs> then some great quotes. Uh, yeah, and then um, Steve Jobs said. Um, some along the lines of you don't the customer doesn't know what it it wants until you give it to them and you and like if, especially in his situation where and even in yours like you're creating something that doesn't exist before like how can someone know that they need something when it hasn't existed before yeah then, one of one of the great uh quotes from henry ford is if i'd asked them what they wanted they would have said faster horses ah uh, yeah that's yeah, so that we, was a better one we ask people what they want and usually the answer is well give me more fuel in the rocket <laughs> right just just Physics, though, physics and, and economics don't work that way, right? If you have to cart the fuel around, it's like you, you put 15 years worth of fuel into your car when you buy it. You imagine towing 15 years worth of fuel and then all the fuel that you need to tow the fuel around, like it just it, it gets completely unrealistic. But satellites have 15 years worth of fuel. And the only way they can do it is that they don't use any. Like they, they try not to move a satellite after you launch it. You put it up there and it's never touched. And that's how they can manage to do it. So yeah, we can put a little more fuel in it, but most of that fuel will be used just dragging it around for the 15 years to try and get you to 15.1 years. Mm. It just it doesn't work. But the future we see is a bustling space economy where things are, are coming together, doing missions together, changing their missions, moving a lot so you can come into low orbits or move into high orbits. 
and uh, and you know, being able to, to service and repair spacecraft, collect space junk, bring it together. There's so many things that people haven't thought of because they're stuck in this paradigm where satellites are disposable. Well, mm. rockets were disposable until uh, until a few years ago. And, uh, and so our goal is to make reusable satellites and refueling satellites as boring as landing a rocket on its tail. The, the, in terms of refueling the, the satellites, the, will they have to come to the refueling station? And my apologies if this is a simple question, but do they have to come to it or will you have like a ROV type thing that will like kind of like bunt off and then like deliver the fuel and then come back? Yeah, good question. So the, the tankers are designed just to be you know, like gas stations. They don't move around. Um, but then there are these tow trucks that I mentioned, these 25 companies working on uh, satellite servicing vehicles. So they're already building the go-between vehicles. Okay. So satellites can either come to us or we can get a, one of the servicing vehicles to be a, a go-between. Okay, makes sense. The, so last uh, last question from the, the people I queried, which is... Um, uh, basically, where does the propellant come from? They are curious or concerned that they think that um, it will be economically stable to constantly be bringing it from Earth up and then from there out. And what are your thoughts on if that is the case or if that just having it up there and then be able to uh, on demand uh, supply customers with gas would be an economically viable thing to do? Yeah, so at the moment, all of all the fuel is going to have to be put on rockets and launched into space. Um, there is no supply from asteroids or the moon yet, so uh, so it's all got to be on a rocket at some point. Um, and so, you know, why does that make sense? Well, your car again, you don't you don't tow around fifteen years worth of fuel in your car. You go to a network of gas stations, and that how does that that gas get to the gas station? Someone's put it in a tanker and towed it to the gas station and offloaded it. And it makes sense because you don't have to cart that around. It's more fuel efficient to do it that way. Same deal here. And it's also very much more business efficient because you don't have to pay for 15 years of fuel up front. And if you decide that, you know, all of a sudden, oh, I've got to do an extra couple of trips to Mexico because I've run out of tequila, you could just go and buy more fuel and drive down to Mexico, right? So it gives you the flexibility as well. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why, even though we've got to launch it from the ground and that's still expensive, we can buy it in bulk and sell it in small amounts. We can we can sort of trade off a whole bunch of different things. Is there's a lot of reasons why it just makes sense to have a network of gas stations instead of towing your fuel. It sounds like it would have like a, a net positive effect in the sense that it would be cheaper to get things into space and then it'd be cheaper to sustain things while it's in space, thus reducing yep. the barrier to entry. Um, and through. and you can put a bigger payload on, a, on a, a smaller rocket because you don't have to carry the fuel with it. So if you want to put a, say you want to send something to the moon, it's going to be three quarters or, or you know, maybe 80 or 90 percent fuel because you've got to use that fuel to get to the moon so instead you can top the rocket up with as much like really useful stuff as possible get it to orbit then get the fuel into it and take it to the moon you can have a much bigger payload on a smaller rocket makes sense the, um, is there in terms of upcoming missions like i mentioned the one to titan but are, are there missions or other than your your own that you're watching uh very attentively and that you're you're excited to see like uh, come through? I'm excited about all the asteroid missions. And having, having looked at asteroid mining and moon mining, um, I think asteroid mining has a couple of advantages. The moon has a couple of advantages, but I got really interested in asteroids. So I, I love the asteroid missions. So really looking forward to Hayabusa coming back. Hayabusa 2 is uh, at uh, Raguyo asteroid. So it, it'll, be, uh, it'll be back in, in the next couple of years. Of course, Osiris Rex is bringing back a sample as well. Um, and then there's the missions to um, to the metal asteroids coming up, like uh, asteroid Psyche and uh, and things like that. So there's so many uh, missions now to asteroids. We're learning about the, the diverse range of asteroids by actually going and visiting them the first time. And every time we go to an asteroid, we learn things, even if what we're learning is, oh, this one looks like the last one. Uh, as yet, most of the time we show up and it looks like the last one in some ways. Mm -hmm. And there are other ways where it just completely floors us. And uh, and so that's been pretty exciting. And the, what are where are the places that you go to, to to stay current on these things? Is there like one portal, or maybe you actually talk to the people who are, who are doing the program, so it's easier. But uh, yeah, yeah, at this at this point, um, you know, word of mouth, people know what I'm interested in and tell me. <laughs> but um, I'm often uh, end up on Space News. Uh, that's a pretty good one. I have via satellite in my inbox for uh, sort of satellite industry, uh, space industry news. Um, yeah, occasionally I'll, I'll browse through a LinkedIn feed 
uh, and because of the friends I have, that uh, tends to pop up space stuff as well. Yeah. Um, excellent. Then uh, for anyone wanting to check out similar things, uh, option A, you know, start a, a space startup and uh, become like Daniel and then get a lot of friends <laughs> around you to get in on these things or uh, B, check out space news and about these other options as well and stay on the podcast as well. That's always a good way to uh, stay current with the space news. Um, yep. So one of the things on your uh, LinkedIn that I thought was really crazy is this idea that you went from something like like zero to like $10 million in sales, like really, really quickly. And one of the things that you're really good at doing is building a team. And and one, that's one of the things that, especially right now, cause I'm working on like a, like a blog series where I break down like the most effective ways to hire people. And mm -hmm. so I'm curious, like how do you source talent and how do you know when someone, cause uh, I think uh, Steve Jobs, I, I just watched like a bunch of movies on Steve Jobs. I don't know why I did this, but I also watched it on a Mac, which I thought was really fun. My girlfriend did not think that was fun. I did. But um, so the he said that like a people pick a people, but at, at a certain point, like you can't be maybe you can't be picking everyone. So like the question is, like, how do you build and 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 source for a plus team people so you can get to 10, 10 million, you know, 100 million and build what you're doing and, you know, change the industry like you're trying to do? Like, how do you actually source for a, a plus uh, people? That 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 was actually one of the hardest things for me, I and mean, this is this is my seventh startup. So uh, so I've I've tried this a few times, and uh, yeah, not all of them have been successful. The um, definitely uh, I wouldn't call myself a great judge of character. I'm not the kind of person who looks at somebody and says, "Oh, I know you'll be awesome." Um, <clears throat> so so I've had to sort of learn the hard way some of the some of the things to do to be able to to figure out how to build a good team. Um, when you're starting up a company, usually the first thing you do is is find friends or people that you've worked with, people that you know, and uh, and try and bring them in and, and sell them on what you're trying to do. Um, so at Deep Space Industries, yeah, yeah, I brought in some folks that I'd worked with before, uh, and that helped, and that led us to growing sales within two years to uh, to about uh, ten million a year. So um, you know, here similarly, my co-founder at uh, at Orbit Fab is somebody that I'd known beforehand and uh, and did a bit of work with. Uh, but quickly, you 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 run out of people in your network who are available, and uh, and so you then have to start having some you know, some processes to to find good people, um, get a network, get uh, um, sort of get your name out there so that that people know who you are when you reach out. Those kind of things can help. Um, but it's like everything else in a startup. There's there's no set recipe. You have to just be relentless, and uh, and set a high bar for yourself, and then try and figure out. When it goes wrong, exactly what you did, because there's never anybody else to blame, and so uh, you learn every time something goes wrong. And uh, I, I got a lot of I got a lot of scars. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. The, a, a lot of people talk about how like that aspect of startups, how you like like the buck stops as you as a negative, but I guess maybe it's just the type of people. Like I know I I enjoy being the only one who's you know it's like who do you yell at? Like yell at yourself. Like you can improve yourself. But, like sometimes like it's out of your your control. Like if your boss is an idiot, like you can't really do that much about it. But if you're the boss and you're the idiot, arguably you can do a lot about that. Like hopefully you can yeah, still correct. I'll, I'll own that. Yep, I'm the boss and I'm the idiot sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. The um, you're absolutely right. I, I don't think anybody ever should be blaming other people. Right? There's mm -hmm. there's very little that you can't control. And if you're in a situation where you know you're not able to do the things you want to do and achieve what you want to do because of of the environment, because of your boss or whatever, find somewhere else to do them. And get out there and uh, and excel. And good people who are always sort of bettering themselves find no end of opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you know, from from trying to build a team, right? It's hard to find good people. So be one of the good people, and and you'll be in demand. Yeah, the one hundred percent agree. The I know I have a couple of friends who that who like I I kind of suspected based on how they were talking that they were doing a really good job at their at their job to be vague on purpose. Um, but they always thought that they were like, maybe like the bottom 20%. And so for people listening, if like, if you're, if you don't know, you're a, a good, you know, an A plus player, for instance, or like one of the best, like imagine what that person is like, that would be the best. And then break down, like if you're in sales, like what would sales look like? Sales is a really good example, but like if you're in customer service, if you're in anything, try and break down like what that person does that is so much better than what you do. And then actually break down what you do in the same fashion and see how it measures up. And you, you like in the for instance with the two people I'm thinking about, one of them it turned out that they actually did like a million dollars in sales in like six months, and they didn't even realize that because they were just like so pessimistic they didn't look into it. And like oh the day 
they they called me up when they when they realized there's like oh lol uh, i did the numbers and and i had to pester them a number of times but like well i did the numbers and it turns out like i did like a million dollars like all by myself like i'm the only one you know, like no one else is even close to me it's like yeah like uh, like try as, <laughs> as much as you can because like emotions are so subjective if you keep things in your head it's so easy for it to get twisted around but if you write it down you see it in black and white if you can make it you know if i know like sales is like an easy thing but uh in the sense that like it, it's numbers but if you can make it some type of number like if and there's this great comic book when i was in college that um uh basically the, the the way it worked was this person was like one person was asking another person in like that way that like college students will like ask philosophical questions they don't have answers to and this person said i'm a great person and the person was like how are you great um and it was like well i'm a kind person and the person said well how are you kind and the person said well I, well uh i'm a thoughtful person it's like well how are you thoughtful and then um there's like pictures of them like walking past like an old lady not holding a door and stuff like that so like there's ways like if you're a kind person, like what does a kind person do? And just try and do those things. So like that's just like my way of like giving advice. But uh, yep. um, for in the terms of self development, because like you're in like this uh, 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 an MBA program right now, are there other ways that you found that people can challenge themselves to constantly be the the best that they can be? And like because like you're you're constantly looking for new ways to educate yourself. And I imagine like you're so busy that that's a hard thing to do. Yeah, but it's the most important thing to do. Um, you know, if you if you spend five percent of your time getting better every day, then you know, in a year you're made up for that five percent just by how much better your ninety five percent is. And after two years, you're blowing things out of the water, right? So take five percent of your day and and spend it getting better. Um, it's it's the best thing you can do for uh, for yourself, for your employer, for whatever, for the world. Like that's it's so important. Um, the trick is knowing whether you should be sending, spending 10% or 50% of your time bettering yourself. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I think about it. So I don't have enough time to not be doing these kinds of things. Um, so yeah, the, the MBA is one. When I was, was younger in my career, I was taking on as many engineering projects as I could. Um, so you know, I found a guy that, that was trying to launch satellites out of a cannon and uh, he wanted some help <laughs> building, building tracking things. So I was trying to build radios and electronics to, to launch out of guns. That was that was just what I was doing. Um, and then I was you know, writing writing up papers about uh, some of these things and talking to people. Um, now I got involved in far too many projects and just had far too much fun. It was great, but each of these things learned me uh, you know, learned a huge amount. Um, so yeah, I got involved in a lot of volunteer projects and uh, you know, wherever I could, you know, did courses and uh, and travelled my. My holidays were, were all just traveling to space conferences because that's what I was having fun. And, uh, and I ended up with a great uh, number of friends and a great community out of that. Um, it, was a, it was a great hobby to have. And, uh, and I learned an enormous amount there. So you know, basically just relentlessly trying to find out ways to learn more, uh, to think in different ways about, uh, about the world and, uh, and understand it and uh, understand who I am and who I'm working with and, and how to build things. And you know, I'm I'm kind of obsessive, I think. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a good trait to have, um, with, with within moderation. Um, <laughs> but uh, one one question I have for you is, uh, can you tell us about a time that you messed, like you messed up, like it didn't work out, but in that screw up, you learned something that that later on helped you be successful? Oh gosh, uh, which of them would you like? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, and there's there's a whole bunch of times when um, I've uh, I've got upset or angry and uh, and and let my emotions get the better of me and lashed out at somebody. That never that never works. I've I took a while to learn that lesson. Apparently, um, you've got to keep a calm head. Um, so you know that's uh, there's a yeah there, there are times when I've been less prepared than I needed to be for a situation that I was in. Um, I'm trying to think of of anything specifically that um, that I can tell <laughs> that um, that would make a good uh, a good anecdote. Um, yeah, and one of the things on a, on a personal note, I've I've moved across the world for uh, uh, for relationships a couple of times, and uh, and those haven't worked out. Um, so you yeah, know that's opened up opportunities but also cost me other opportunities everything's a trade-off mm -hmm. and uh, and that's really hard so one thing that that you know i wish i'd had a life partner uh through this and uh, and perhaps my life choices have not let me do that and uh, i completely understand that, that that's a trade-off 
and uh, I encourage people to think a lot about that and uh, and how they're going to organize their life. Is it? I imagine like the I was I was reading this book called Titan. It's about Rockefeller and how at a certain point in his life, after he became successful, it was really hard for him to find people that weren't assholes um, that would take advantage of him and, and stuff like that. And so I always wondered like the more successful you get, is it harder to find people to connect with like on a relationship level or cause like, I guess there's like that song that's like, um, uh, I don't, I don't want to sing it, but basically he's saying like the person is a gold digger, <laughs> <laughs> but they're not hanging around with some, someone who's broke. Um, like, how do you like, like, how do you know, like, how, how can you tell like a genuine relationship for someone who's just trying to be like a sycophant for like the fact that you're doing well or, or, or whatnot. It, it kind of reminds me just like an added add on point that the Dalai Lama said that um, that relationships based or formed on status or contingent on status. So like if you make people like relationships because you're wealthier or because you're like your status in, in a certain situation, as soon as you lose it, they tend to go away. Um, I don't know if you've found any um, thoughts on that or. Um, yeah, I think I think that's why people end up making um, friendships easier when they're younger. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, you make, you thrust with together with people that, when you're younger that, um, you know, you're not there just because of your career. And, uh, and even if you are together from your career, you're, you're spending time where it's not about the politics and, uh, and the maneuvering of a business. So, you know, a lot of my best friendships are, are coming from, uh, you know, late teens uh, and through my twenties, um, you know, through my thirties, I've been running businesses and things. And, you know, the sacrifice you make is you need to focus on on making that business successful. And so every interaction you're weighing up against that um, in, a, in a similar way to, you know, always spending time improving yourself. It's also important to, to always spend time making sure that uh, that you're relaxed and not stressed and staying sane. Um, and, and I was looking at a, an article just the other day about how important it is for CEOs to have hobby to have hobbies. Um, because that's that's something that you can then take your mind off things and relax. So uh, yeah, I'd echo that. That's that's one of the things that I've not done well is maintain my hobbies uh, through all of these startups and through all the moves around the world that I've done. Um, so I'd I'd encourage that. And then through the hobbies, you'll you'll find people that you can connect with where it's not based on business relationships and status. The, um, well, uh, T Tito is saying that uh, the song that I was referencing is his workout song. <laughs> and that it would be a, a great space station mixtape, the Dalai Lama plus Kanye. Uh, but in, ter in terms of your uh, in terms of your hobbies, um, are there are any are there any that you have maintained? And if not, I have a recommendation for you. But um, I'm hoping you, I've, I'm hoping there's there's some that you've you've had and you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah, so I'm about to get another motorbike. Um, mm -hmm. I, I haven't had one for the last few years. That uh, um, enjoy riding the motorbike. Um, also, I, I grew up in Tasmania on my mountain. Uh, I had a, a mountain range in my backyard, so did a lot of hiking, um, which my, my whole family was into there. And uh, and so still, I'll uh, you know go up into the high Sierras or something and disappear for a couple of days um, with a with a couple of friends. And that's uh, that's my best way to 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 sort of de-stress and uh, and get away from uh, from everything. So so those are my hobbies. Those are, those are good, especially it, it kind of ties into physical fitness. So like, you, you know, you're taking care of yourself. The interesting um, uh, corollary uh, between another leader and yourself is uh, Teddy Roosevelt, when he was uh, president, he would routinely go off into, I think it was Yellowstone. Like he'd just be gone for like six weeks. And one time he was out there, like no one could, it's not like modern time. No one could find him. And so like, there's like, he's been the president, but he, he's out there one time. And this, uh, I think this like this, like this a mountain lion tried killing his dog and he's on horseback. So he like gallops up to the, to the mountain lion jumps off the horse and like stabs it in the head, like rips it <laughs> off of the dog and then like bounce back on and then just gets back on his horse. Like that's I, I like to imagine that's me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you work, work, work really hard and be around uh, mountain lions and maybe like the two will work out. <laughs> so that's, you probably shouldn't uh, cultivate that opportunity, but, um, so in uh, and we talked a lot about like things that you're you're good at, um, other other than like a couple of ones that you've mentioned. Is there anything that you're just like, like, unabashed? Maybe not unabashedly. Like you can be shameful of it, but um, <laughs> in the sense that is there anything that you're 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 bad at or like that you're that you're like, are argu arguably like something that you're just like don't have a knack for or have had the time to uh, specialize down and uh, improve upon it. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm making more time now to um, to improve my emotional intelligence, uh, to become sort of a better judge of character and uh, and those kind of things. I'm uh, realizing that if I want to build teams around myself, that's that's probably the most important thing uh, that I need to do. Um, so that's that's one that I'm actively working on. Um, but there are things I I don't enjoy doing that I can do. Um, and so these are the first things that I I hire really good people for, is um, you know doing the accounts of the business. And, uh, and you know, putting together financial projections can be fine, uh, but grinding through the spreadsheets and uh, and making sure they're exactingly right is just not me. Um, so you know, I'm I'm always you know keen to to find somebody else to fill that role. Mm. Um, it may surprise you, but the the whole press publicity whatever is is not something that I come to naturally. Um, so thankfully, my my business partner in Orbit Fab. Is, uh, he's an international business major, and uh, you know, used to work for for T1 Automotive Suppliers. So Jeremy's been uh, been really good at, at handling most of the marketing and things like that for uh, for Albert Fab. Mm. Um, and I just get to be the pretty face. But, uh, you didn't have to laugh at that, really. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you don't know uh, how I was laughing at. It could be like laughing with you, or, or, or you know, you never know. But um, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, um, a, a book recommendation for you then, since you are working on emotional intelligence, is the best the best book I have found, um, other than like How to Win Friends and Influence Others, I think it's a really good one. But that's more for like people who are horrible at it. Um, but there's a book. Or psychopaths, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 one or the other. So the <laughs> one one in 20 people are psychopaths, apparently. And I, I, I run into a lot. Of, you ever just think about that? Like you walking down the street, like just count like every 20 people, like psychopath. One every next 20 psychopath. Like that's how that's prevalent terrifying. they are in the yeah, yeah. Right. Well, they're not all bad, you know, like, That's um, true. yeah, yeah. I talked to a couple of doctors and I imply that they were bad on accident and they, uh, I got yelled at, but, um, they're not like a lot of them, they just think differently. It's like, uh, schizophrenic people. Like most of them are not harm. Like um, the majority of them are not uh, harmful people. They're just, uh, you know, that's the media. Like when they talk, like for instance, like doctors for the longest time, like if you, if you were to take yourself and like put yourself in the sixties you, and put yourself in a movie, you'd probably be the villain. Like you, you know, you're <laughs> building a gas station in space, like, um, ah. you're trying to, you know, like it, but nowadays, like maybe we're nicer to scientists. So like, it, it definitely is a, like a media thing, but the book I'd recommend to you is, um, uh, is Walter Isaacson's. I'm actually staring at it. Uh, ben, Benjamin Franklin or Walter Isaacson. The, it goes from like when he was a, Benjamin Franklin was a kid and he was just a complete idiot and interacting with people to the point where he misread situations time and time again and got stranded in England with like no money to his name. And uh, <laughs> by the end of it, he's the reason that the French came in and, you know, helped us beat up the the English. And um, so like, the, and you can see how he made the evolution over time, which is really good. And oh, cool. uh, I, I read that down. Yeah. I'm going to look it up. Yeah. Cool. It's really, really good. And it's a, it's a, a thin book. And if you like Benjamin Franklin, you can read more, but like, that's the, it's a really good one. Um, so uh let's see next i want to i, I want to make sure I, I asked all the really fun questions um uh i think i asked all okay i asked these sorry there's like so many things so many screens up oh uh what was uh do you do you remember the the moment or time because you've you've basically lived through the entire space uh industry because i think you were born in 1961 so you probably even remember the apollo landings but my dad was born when you were about the time you were born. He remembers them landing on the moon. So, like, what was the what was the moment that you knew that space was would be your final frontier? So, uh, yeah, I was born in seventy seven. So I missed the moon stuff as well. But, okay, well, I don't know why I read sixty one. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were old. I was giving my dad shit the other day. I was like, "Look what this guy accomplished, and he's your age." <laughs> uh, I'm not a good son, but um, all right. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Well, okay. But, uh, so yeah, what was the, what was the moment he's going to watch this, but what was the moment, uh, that you knew that space would be for you then uh, since you were born in 77? Well, my, my dad's an engineer and my mom's a, a chemist, a scientist. Um, and so I grew up in, in you know, rural Tasmania, but the, um, we had a wall of science fiction at home. So I guess I, I read too much science fiction. Um, and, uh, you know, learned to program a computer when I was three or four because my parents bought one when uh, when nobody else had one in the world. Um, so you know, I had that opportunity, which is great. But the um, it, it wasn't until I got to, to university and was thinking, oh, what do I want to do with my life? Um, and and uh, realized, you know, I, I want to do something that's useful for, for humanity. Um, and 
perhaps because I've read science fiction, I don't know, I, I, I've never thought small. Um, so, you know, what, what would make a difference in 100 years or, or 500 years? Uh, what would really matter? And, uh, and so it struck me that um, addressing existential risks was, was really the only thing that I could get excited about long term. And, uh, and that, you know, if we can mitigate some of the existential risks that threaten humanity, that would be a very good thing. Um, and so getting people off Earth is, is the best way to do that. And, uh, and that was when I made a decision that, you know, this would be a, a fun career. And, uh, and I intended to, to do that. And, uh, and so I started to think about that fairly methodically. You know, how, do we, how do we create the first permanent job in space? Because I couldn't see the government, um, you know, making a, the long term um, transition of, of settling the solar system. So how do we pay for it? And, uh, and everything's just kind of flowed from there. So in terms of like staying in space long term, do you do you see anyone having a, a effective solutions to ionizing radiation? Because other than just micro microgravity as a, a threat and just like the the cost of getting people up there, I haven't really been and I've, I've been reading about this extensively. This is one of the things that I was trying to build for a while, but um, I don't see any real effective way to uh, counteract ionized radiation, which which is really like the big limiter I see in people living in space long term. So uh, interesting. I one of the the crazy things I've I've done in my career was building desktop nuclear fusion reactors, and uh, and and neutron cameras and things. So so for a while I was a registered radiation worker and uh, and had to think deeply about what that went that meant for me. Um, but then uh, you know as I as I got an understanding of that, I realized that there's no incentive for politicians to lower radiation standards. Their only incentive is to raise them and show that they care about people. Um, because people just, you can't see it. You don't understand it. Um, it, it is a, a sort of tricky concept to understand. So the radiation limits that we have are actually far higher than what we actually, what we need. And most of the literature supports that, but you're not going to see the regulation change because politicians don't get elected on that basis. So, so that's the sort of first thing. And you've also got to realize you're constantly being shot through by radiation. Right now, as you sit there, there is potassium and, and sodium and, and you know, various things in the walls. That there's lead, which has uh, uranium decay products. Uh, we, we are sitting bathed in radiation. The cosmic rays are hitting the atmosphere and shattering into, into thousands of pieces. And we're, we're bathed in a shower of radiation. It's all about dose rates and, uh, and your body's ability to react. So just like you shouldn't uh, stand in front of a too close to a, a furnace, right? you'll get yourself burnt. You mm -hmm. don't want the radiation to hit you too quickly all at once. But at low doses, it's actually fine. So we're getting low doses right now. It's a chronic low dose, and, and we're just fine. We, we live reasonably healthy lives. In fact, there's more damage to our DNA going on from uh, um, uh, free radicals in, in like the chemical stuff in our cells than there is from the radiation damage. Mm. And so some of the studies have shown that, that um, having a chronic dose of radiation that's slightly higher than the background we experience now actually activates the cell's repair mechanisms and makes you better able to tolerate larger doses in the future and doesn't seem to have a detrimental effect. The highest background rates of radiation in the world, just sort of ambient radiation coming out of the rocks and things, is, um, is in uh, Iran. It's on the, the Caspian Sea. Uh, is a town there and the cancer rates there are lower than the average around the world so clearly there's there's something a little wrong about the way that we think about it now yes in in high doses it'll kill you but in high doses infrared radiation will kill you in high doses many things will kill you mm. um, so it's a it's a it's a bit about that balance so what does that mean well we need to uh we need to manage the balance of how much radiation we're getting and, and how quickly we're getting that dose so you don't want to be in space in the middle of the radiation belts and you don't want to be out and exposed when there's a solar storm but apart from that we're probably okay so don't put your habitat in the radiation belts if you put it inside the magnetosphere and and uh there's a, a great book by al globus um called uh, the high frontier an easier way um that he, he put out uh um just last year that sort of outlines a plan for putting uh, habitats in low equatorial orbit, and that's inside the radiation belts and, and avoids the most of the radiation that, that, for example, the International Space Station gets. So it's completely viable to live there long term with, with effectively no radiation shielding, which then you can, you can build the habitat. But if you go outside the radiation belts into 
into uh, you know lunar space and uh, and around the sun, then you've got the risk of the uh, of the solar flares happening. And so you want to have somewhere that you can hide in case of a solar flare, and you want a good early warning system that tells you to to get out of the way um, when a when a flare is coming. So those are those are mitigations. How much shielding do you need, and all those kind of things? Well, when we're mining asteroids and uh, and we've got lots of material, or we're mining the moon. Um, I don't think that's going to be too much of a problem. So I'm I'm very much an optimist about uh, uh, about the effect of uh, of radiation when we've when we've learned more about it and when we've got ways to manage it in deep space. Excellent. So <laughs> the, I have uh, my like uh, I, I asked kind of the same questions the last like three or four. So if anyone listening in, in the live stream has any last minute questions, ask them in the stream because when I'm done here, we're gonna call it. <laughs> we're gonna call it. Okay. So but uh, one one thing I've been and what we wanted to achieve in this interview is getting people excited about space, getting people involved in space. So like, I think there's a lot of things we talked about today that gets people excited. There's like so many things going on, whether it's the idea that it's going to be like, there's, there's a lot of people just even looking to invest. There's a lot of people moving in and creating startups and creating businesses. It's, it's, it's an amazing time to get, get going. So one of the things that I've enjoyed with my guests is creating like a sort of challenge for listeners to try out, like to in some way, try out what space would be like for them and where they could find their own niche. And so uh, my question is like, what would be a good challenge? Like an example might be like, go to two space conferences and like maybe suggest a conference, um, write, like do some research and do a, a, a writing thing for on space on on um, using your abilities and, and uh, uh, to in your niche to do something. That's a horrible example, but you know what I'm saying? Like what would be a, what would be a good challenge for people listening um, to find out where they could fit in in the space industry hmm. so there are a whole bunch of things when i when i got started in this industry um i guess the, the first thing i did was join the national space society um so i'm now on the on the board of advisors of the national space society it's a, a 30 or forty thousand member grassroots organization um last month they held the international space development conference and there are a lot of hardcore professionals there there were some really good tracks uh, but there are also a lot of people who are working you know, not in engineering, but doing great things in um, you know, like Brian's artwork, um, like policy work uh, and, and business plans and things like that were being presented. So there's a, a huge range of, of activities. So that's a great place to get uh, exposure. Um, so the International Space Development Conference and, and just joining the National Space Society. Um, if you're technically inclined, then you know, find a project or start one. Um, so the second week of being in the National Space Society, I, uh, we had a, a new chapter at my university and, and I stood up and said, we should do a project, like build a satellite or something like that. So four days later, we had a meeting and I said, okay, what, uh, like 20 people showed up, it blew me away. I said, all right, what project do we want to do? Everybody looked confused and said, I thought you said we were building a satellite. Um, so we spent <laughs> the next four years really learning how not to build a satellite. But, um, but at the same time, like learning a lot about satellites. And, and so I, I was able to go from there to getting a job in the space industry uh, without ever having studied any courses in aerospace. Um, it's much easier nowadays as well because CubeSats and, and various things, you can get the plans online and you can get good courses on how to do them online um, that never existed when I was in first year undergrad. So there's a whole bunch of resources out there. So jump on there and just just try putting together a technical project, build a rocket, build a small satellite, get some friends together. It's uh, it's surprising how accessible it is if you really put your mind to it. Mm -hmm. And I will echo this point uh, with a quote, which I read too much, so I'm gonna, uh, there's gonna be a lot of these, but um, the quote is uh, Edison, Thomas Edison was asked after people find out that he spent like a thousand, he, he, he had like a thousand different iterations of a light bulb before he found one that worked. People said, um, you know, I asked him, Edison, do you feel like you, like you had a thousand failures or something like that? And he said, no, I, I found a thousand ways not to make a light bulb or, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like so, so often, even, even though we have like the ultimate ability to learn and to choose what we're doing at any point in time with the internet, with a phone, at any point in time, someone could look something up that could change their life. Um, it's almost like there, there's even some articles on this, like that, like too much choice is bad, but like just pick something and like dig really, really deep on it. And, and even like seek out the failure, like what's a fail point? Like if this didn't work, would that disprove what you're doing? And like, try and do that. And just like be completely comfortable with the failure. Like so often the, the people, there's a lot of people email me and I can, you can kind of like hear like the inherent fear in trying things. And I have that problem as well. So I like, I'll own that, but like, just be willing to, to fail and to be willing to try things. And like Daniel's saying, like, 
if you just try and dig deep on it, even if nothing comes from it other than learning how not to do a bunch of things, you'll learn how not to do a bunch of things. Like that's really, really beneficial. Like, um, I'll hire, I'll hire someone who knows 400 ways not to build a satellite over somebody who's never tried. Yeah, there you go. Any you day said, of the week. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. So yeah. the, hey, I'll give you, I'll give you a quote back. Um, okay. There are no statues built to critics. Yeah. Forget what people are saying about your failures. You're learning. Those people who aren't trying are the ones who are who are never going to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> True. So uh, this is a, an open-ended question I like to ask people, which is, what is a question that you have that you do not have the answer to that you would love answered? Um, so an example, I'll like kind of give you time to think about it. An example I give is, um, so the Big Bang is responsible for the exi existence of the universe. So I always wonder, like, if I were to go back in time and like kind of like snuff out the Big Bang, what would be here and instead? And then what was here before the Big Bang? I wonder these things. Um, the only response I get is even the statement of before kind of illustrates that it's hard to conceptualize what life without the Big Bang would be like because we're I'm using concepts that were developed inside the box to describe a universe that doesn't exist, that doesn't have boxes at all. I don't know. That's the best exam answer I got. But that's one of the things that bugs me, and I want to know. I want to know. But if, what, what's something? Uh, what's a question that you have or uh, that you do not that do not have the answer to? So. Some things that I've that I've thought deeply about, um, uh, you know, to go back to to existential risks, perhaps. Um, can we make AI safe? Is that even possible? I'd love to know the answer to that. Um, where's the closest gamma ray burster? Like, is there one that's going to kill us? The odds are yes. We just don't know which millennia or or uh, which which million years in the in the, how many million years in the future it might, and how fast we have to run. Um, you know, can we hack our way out of the simulation that we're probably living in? The, these are fundamental questions that uh, um, I, I wish I knew answers to. The, there's a John Scalzi. I don't know if you've read anything by him, like the Old Man's War, um, Collapsing Empire. It's really good. I, I, I've read Old Man's War. Yeah, it's been made into a TV series. Well, he has a he has a like a a sequel series because it's like a trilogy in Old Man's War. Um, where it's like um, anthology series, like a not an anthology, a a, a, a serial like a Captain Captain Gordon. I don't I don't watch shows from the '60s, but like in the '60s, you'd have like episodic TV shows, and so he wrote a book with episodic chapters that you could enjoy in piecemeal. Oh, and there's one where a guy's in in a simulation, and how he gets out of it's really interesting. So I would I'm gonna look it up, but um, it's called like <laughs> Being Human or something like that. But it's by oh, John yeah, Scalzi. Send so. me the link. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you the link. But um, so in in the in terms of uh, book recommendations or research recommendations, are there some key books that you would recommend people check out or that you give to people often that uh, a listener might enjoy reading? Cool. Um, yeah, there's a couple that I've given people over the years. Um, the High Frontier is is always a favorite for someone who's uh, who's already interested. I mean, it's now quite dated, and uh, and the main thing that we learned there was don't rely on the space shuttle. And uh, and the next wonderful NASA launch vehicle to bring down launch costs, but uh, but a lot of the concepts in there were were super interesting. Um, Silicon Sky is uh, is a great one. That's about how orbital sciences was built, um, and similarly, uh, eccentric orbits is about how iridium was saved. Um, because you know, I obsess a lot about how in the world we're going to pay to do all these things, and and you know believe that uh, um, that. Commerce and uh, and capitalism are are tools that we can use for uh, for advantage to try and get things done. Um, so those last two are, uh, are very much about building businesses. Excellent recommendations. I'm I'm definitely going to check them out. Uh, and for people who are really cheap like me, you can get a library card and then get Overwatch and then download those books on your phone. And it's not stealing, so it's, you have no excuse. Um, so what is a problem you're currently having that uh, you would love either from the audience? That's on in this live stream right now, or people are going to listen later to help you out on. Who um, I can give you a big problem. Um, the uh, and the reason that we don't have asteroid mining is we can't get secure tenure, right? I, uh, I, I that's a tricky problem, right? Solving the uh, the political and uh, legislative and regulatory issues around how we get secure tenure over minerals in the ground on an asteroid, um, so that we can start building value in that. Um, that's a 
that's a, a huge problem that people could spend their careers trying to solve. Um, yeah, other other interesting things um, and uh, and perhaps questions to ask. Um, oh, let's see. I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of things that um, that I would like to try. Um, there's a lot of businesses that uh, and opportunities that I see. Um, yeah, I'm I'm very keen to give away a lot of those. So I challenge people to to come up with ideas and try ideas, and uh, and you know blow me away with with your ideas on uh, and how you're going to change the world uh, and how you're going to do it in. Uh, in an effective way that builds a, builds a good business. What are the business models going to look like when the BFR becomes a reality? What are the business models going to look like when you know, Orbit Fab becomes a reality and you can have uh, near unlimited fuel on orbit? Uh, what is the world going to look like when the next technologies come out? Those are, those are some really fascinating things. Mm -hmm. All right, so the last thing I like to, I always like it when the guest leaves us with a quote, um, even though like what you said was very hopeful, so maybe that should, could, could be what we end on, but is there a quote, saying, or concept that you would like people to be romantic and honest they go about their day? Other than, I guess like what you said was really, really good, but anything, <laughs> anything additional to that? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the future is what we make it, really. Um, get stuck in. It's... Uh, I mean, I'm a I'm a country boy from Tasmania, and uh, and you know, seem to have moved the needle a little bit on a on a couple of interesting things. Uh, we need many more people just just pushing on different ways to to make the future that we want to see come about. Excellent. Then I'm going to. And that was Daniel Faber, CEO of Orbit Fab Gas Station Space. Check my orbitfab.space. That's O-R-B-I-T-F-A-B dot space, S-P-A-C-E. And follow them along, watch their stuff. He is constantly doing amazing things. And I personally love what he is doing. And I look forward to seeing more of his developments in the future. Check the show notes for links to his LinkedIn, er all, everything. Just sh check the show notes. If there's anything in this episode you want to learn more about, check the show notes. It's probably there. Let me know if you enjoyed this live stream. All right, because I, I enjoyed it and I, I really would like to hear if anyone else did. Or if you hated it, let me know either way. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We can be found on Twitter at Lowell this year, Facebook, and on the website, learningwithlowell.com. Also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every Monday, new episodes every Tuesday, and new blog posts around every Thursday. Remember to share and tell your friends. Please and thank you.